And if we're lucky, we should be live. Hey, folks. Let's see who's hanging in today. Oh, yeah. Got a few of the good folks. Keeping the quality in. It's good. Darius. Yo. Jace. Elevator Simulator. Good to see you here. Koso. Markamatu. I don't think I've seen your name here before. Hello. Uh, Shimera Upon the Pimp. Good to have you. All right. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Thank you, Pompta Pimp. Always on point with letting me know that video and audio is okay. Yeah, so the stuff on the right up there um, is where we left off last week, which was we had some 3D objects and some stuff falling, and that's really cool. Um, oh, yeah. Like, uh, Shimera had his stream on Saturday, which was ace. Really good. So it tore through uh, his engine. And, again, the, the, the way the shaders are composed and the pipelines and stuff is pretty cool. So if you're interested in this kind of... Like, different weird ways of doing this kind of stuff, then see it. Oh, nice. Pond Pimp's checked out already. Um, oh, and he also did a two-hour stream yesterday on making an actual game. I will have to watch that. That might be what I do after this, because I'm normally brain dead after this. Okay, so plan for tonight is we're going to do Fong Lighting, which is super simple. So I don't think it's going to take us a massive amount of time. Um, and then I'm going to go on... Basically, I've had a few questions about a few different things. One about um, resources on learning GL type stuff. Another one just on threads. I've had a lot of confusion around there. Um, one on, I'm going to do a little bit on the input system I'm working on. And I'm actually just going to write a note on the board to remember. I've forgotten. Already! This is why I need to write this stuff down. Um, there was something else I was going to rant about. Oh yeah, projects. One second, let me write this down. Cool. Projects and repos and things like that. Ah! Yes. Now I'll remember. I have the worst memory, so this is necessary. Okay, so... We did... We, ha we have some code. I've just... I actually just left... Uh, hey, HPR. Um, I left the code how it was from last week. We're going to do a little bit of tidying up, and then we're going to carry on. So, but most of it's, it's pretty simple. So, what I'm going to do is just a little bit of cleanup. So, we had some camera code here. Let's take the cameras and move them up there. We have some, a type, like an object type, which we call thing. So we've got this, then we've got the rendering code. Here's our vertex stage and our fragment stage. And our pipeline. Uh, we'll come back to this in a second. We have a function that we're using for just getting a number that increases with time uh, called now. We've got the world to view space, which takes a camera. So that really belongs up in camera code. Up here. We've got a model to world space matrixy function which belongs with things so this will give you the transform matrix for an object um, we got a function which updates a thing which at the moment is just making them full and when they get to the bottom they it's using mod so when it gets to zero it goes back to 40 so they're just falling from 40 um, and oh yeah then we've got the actual drawing well, the kind of the the uh, main loop step function, which is just uh, yeah updating a few things. Okay, let's go through. So yeah, we can start at the bottom. Basically, we've got our main loop, uh, some code that gets called uh, when things are initialized. That's fine how it is. We're calling draw every single loop, and we're stepping the host, which is saying, hey, grab all the input events from whatever the system is. So in this case, it's SDL, and Pull them all in, process them. Um, that means we'll get like when things resize and all that kind of stuff. Um, we've got, we're updating the resolution of the current viewport. So in GL you have viewports. That's what you, that's the area of the screen or window or whatever you're drawing into. So we're gonna update that size to match the size of the current surface. And a surface is your actual window. This is the, in your window managers thing that you can draw stuff into. We clear, 
uh, that GL command to blank all the graphics off, and then we're going to loop through all of the things that we've got. Um, so let's bring up the REPL. Uh, yeah, that's fine. And we've got some things. There, we've got some thing objects. Um, and for each of those, we're going to call update thing on it, and then we're going to draw it. So this is the map G, the thing that takes a stream and maps it over a GPU pipeline and draws stuff up there. And then we say swap, because it's double buffering. We're drawing to a buffer that we can't see, and then we're swapping, making that one that we can see, and then we start drawing to the one that's now the back buffer. And, or hidden buffer, probably more accurately. Ah, I'm not going into those details. I don't understand them. Okay, so the only other thing, let's go and look at update thing. And this, uh, yeah, this is just setting the Y position of the thing to be minus 0.01, and then we're modulating 40. So that's roughly what we had. And now we want to add some lighting. Um, let's have a look at what's going on, because there is action in the stream. Yeah, it's good to have it, you here at Elevator Simulator. Um, I've been seeing you around on YouTube a lot, so that's been cool. Um, Darius, hey man. Um, oh, so <laughs> we've got bots now. Thanks, Ramiro. So we'll see what's going on there. Um, da 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 da. da. Okay. Yeah, feel free, carry on experimenting, Shin. That's, uh, that's fine. Just don't bring a freaking bot army into it. I like most of the people watching to be real. At least half. Okay, so lighting. We are going to be doing um, a type of lighting called Fong lighting. And it's a very simple model. And it's based on the idea that the light can be the lighting of an object. <laughs> Chimera, I'll bring the bot there online. Got it. Yep, that's basically what I said. Please don't do the thing. That's like, yeah. Perfect. Anyway, we're going to draw a thing. And the Fong model of lighting breaks down how an object's lit into three components. There's ambient light, which is the light that's kind of coming from everywhere, bouncing all around, and it's equal from all directions. So that won't give you a shadow. It's just all around equal. And that Again, we have some light. So, so we have a main light in this room up there, but it's not just a hard shadow because we've got light bouncing all around. That's kind of become our ambient light, stuff from the window, all that kind of stuff. And then you have your diffuse lighting. Sorry, yeah, diffuse lighting. That actually depends on the light. So we, we do have, like say, if there was less ambient light, we would see that there was light on this side and a hard shadow down here. So there is the effect of the light, so that matters which direction the light is compared to the object. So as we move the object around relative to the light, if I can keep it on camera, the shadow will change slightly. And then the last part is there's a bit that's shinier than all the rest. And so there's a, a, what they call a specular element. And um, so we want to simulate that as well. So that's how they break down into the three parts. Um, there's reasoning behind it and logic and decent decisions, but we won't be talking about them because I can't memorize those. But um, yes, that's the, it's the rough thing. We might be able to get a bit of shine on there. There we go. There's your specular coming in. So you've got your diffuse and your ambient and your specular. So we're going we're gonna to do some of that. We'll play around. Right. <laughs> Chimera's bringing in teapots. Because if you can't render anything else, I render cubes. Damn it. I was actually, oh, I need to, I'm hoping that next week I can show something kind of cool. I've been working on a um, hackathon for the last two days at work and um, made a little remote control app for sending uh, vector fours from loads of sliders and touchpads and stuff back to the desktop. Um, so then I was using it with Keppel to move objects around and stuff. It's going to be, that's going to be fun when I get it working properly. Um, right. How do we start? How do we start? Okay. The first thing we're gonna want let's do some doodling have i got my doodle system turned on am i out of doodle this is unacceptable okay doodling engaged that's a bit better there we go right so one 
Where should we start? Actually, let's do the ambient lighting first, because that's the simplest. We are going to... Go to our fragment shader, and we're going to have an amount of light. And so we're going to have a... The object itself has some kind of color. The physical, like, the properties of the object that when light hits it, that's it's going to absorb and reflect and refract certain uh, wavelengths of light. So we're going to call that the object color. And in this case, so far we've been using this, um, this value color that we've been passing in from the previous stage. And we just made that value up. So we have some vertices. Let's see what that stream is called. Yeah, so we have a GPU array. Um, and it's nil at the moment. Okay, let's set that. We have a buffer stream. We definitely have one of them because we're drawing with it. And then the buffer stream GPU arrays are there. Um, and the first one of that. There we go. Set a GPU array to that. Right now we can. Now we have a GPU array. And if we pull it, this is the vertex data for our cube that we're drawing many times on the right. And it has three components. We have positions here. Ooh, that was going a bit janky. We have um, normals here. We'll talk about normals soon. And we have texture coordinates here which we'll also talk about a little bit later. But we were noticing that the um, position is a value between uh, minus 0.5 and 0.5, which means if we just add 0.5, then we've got values in the range zero to one. And if we've got, and those are usable for colors. So we just, over here somewhere, let's have a look, where are we? Yeah, we just make up the color by taking the position and adding 0.5 to every component. And then we pass that down to the next stage and we were just coloring the object with that. Um, I'm gonna get rid of this now and we're gonna start out with just a red object and then later we'll, you know, put some textures on it and make it look a bit, a little bit better, marginally less crap. So let's get rid of this. And that means we're not passing a value here which might mean this throws an error, which makes sense. Um, because color is no longer going to be coming in here, which means we need to give this a value. So let's just do red. And frag stage no longer takes a vector three. So we will do this. Color is undefined, of course it is. So we're going to have object color. Um, and we'll say continue. Okay, now we've got a bunch of objects and they all look really flat because there's no shading. There was no shading going on before, but at least the co color differentiation on the different sides made us kind of see that it was a cube. Now we're back to just flat things. <laughs> okay, let's see what's going on over here. Um, what are you up to, Shin? Example.com. It's exciting stuff. I let you people have... Oh, what's this? Okay. Clearly I need to read some of the backstory in the chat. <laughs> Fortune Baggers. Hello. Baggers Fortune for today is nothing. Oh, wow. That is bleak. At least it's not future. <laughs> Are we having a little too much fun in the chat? Nah. Keep going. Right. What was I doing? It's not too much fun. It is slightly distracting, but keep doing it because I'm going to be distracted anyway. And then I'm, I'm happy when I have a reason rather than just kind of phasing out and going into the middle distance. Let us apply coffee. Sorry if I'm a bit sniffy today as well. Hay fever's turning up in Norway. Only very slightly, but it's there. I can feel it. Ugh. Right, so... We have red cubes, lots and lots of red cubes, and I am on the wrong machine. Got to switch back. Right, so we have no color. We've got an object color, we're gonna start with that. It's a really loud red. So, 
the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have some kind of final light amount. So some value between 0 and 1, which is the amount of light hitting this particular fragment. Remember in the fragment shader, so we're dealing with essentially what's kind of like a pixel with depth. But there can be many on the same XY coordinate. So these are... Fra fragment is just a better name for it. I'm glad we've got these ones. So um, we'll call it light amount for the lack of a... There, no, the lack of a better term. There are definitely better terms. But um, so if we set it to one, and then we're going to multiply the object color by the light amount. So if it's one, it's this. To begin with, we have no light, so there's no, no illumination. So this is where we're going to start from. Ambient light. Ambient light is coming from all directions. So it's a constant. So we can represent it just with a float. So we will have a tiny amount. Let's just say 0.1. And our final light amount needs to have this ambient. So we do that. And I realize that I'm using lit and not let star. So it can't see the other things in that scope. And now faintly we can see our cubes again. Let's get rid of that. Okay, so that's still completely flat. We can't see the difference on any side because there is no difference. We're getting the same light from all directions. That's our ambient. So we need... The next one, diffuse light. Now, I don't have a torch here, so we can't demo this properly. But, everyone's played with torches. Ah, get rid of this. If we have a light, if we have a surface to start with, and we have a light shining down on it, especially if it's directed, it's going to be stronger if the light's coming straight down than if it is coming from an angle. So if it's coming, the light's coming from an angle, it's going to be smeared out over a greater area. And so the, there is a, there's a fixed amount of energy coming out of the bulb or the sun or whatever. If it's spread over a large amount of area, that means that energy is being spread, which means less light, like per fragment in our case. Less, less light per point on the object. So we need to simulate that, which means we need to have some value which goes from, if the light's coming from straight above, and it's, this is straight above if it's a flat object, what we're really talking about is the normal to the surface. Oh yeah, the world's straightest lines from the world's shakiest hands. Right. Um, if the light's here, then the line coming, oh, the line of light coming down, I've got a feeling, no, I can't have that. Sorry, I thought I had a second screen enabled and that was throwing off. It's just me writing, drawing really badly. Okay, if the light's straight above, then we're gonna have this vector that's exactly the same. And at this point, we want a value one. And if it's exactly 90 degrees, we want zero. So if it's coming in this way, at that point, we can say the light's coming is parallel to the plane, so it's coming straight past it. So we don't need that either. And in that case, we want zero. Now, there is a very simple function that will give us this. If we take the, if we have some other vector and we, know, and we have this angle here, cosine of that angle, is going to give us the value we want if it is exactly the same as this one now point that may trip you up like when you are talking about a vector to a light to a light vector it's always from the point to the light not the other way around so you normally i was thinking kind of hey light beams especially when it starts now light rays coming from the light so the light direction is this way your light vectors are normally to your light and also the same the view direct the view direction goes from the point you're looking at to the eye. Details actually makes things simpler. So what we're gonna do is we have our vector going this way. If the angle between um, these two is zero, it's gonna give one. So we can just do that up in the REPL up here. Cos zero is one. And cos, and it's gonna be in radians. So we'll just do radians. 90 degrees is essentially zero. That's a very small number. So that's the function we're going to use. So now we need to, we have a different problem. Given two vectors, one going to a light and one that is normal from the surface, how do we get the cosine of the angle between those two vectors? And there's another function that's going to help us a lot here, which is the dot product. And the dot product is actually pretty simple, so I'll just draw it out. Let's, uh, let's write down dot over here. Say we have two vectors. Um, so we have, let's do, 
Yeah, let's do it like this. So it's one and two and three, and we have another consistency. And we have another vector, which is four and five and six. This is going to be called vector A, and this is called vector B. The dot product of A and B is 1 times 4 plus 2 times 5 plus 3 times 6. So we're multiplying these components. So x with the x, y with the y, and z with the z, and then we're adding them all together. So dot product is going to give you a single number. And depending on the type of the vector, it's, it has interesting properties. So if both of your vectors are normal, that means they have a length that is exactly one. They've been normalized. Um, it's a great way to explain what normal means. Yeah, they've been normalized. I don't know. Everyone knows what we mean now. No, the length of the vector itself is one. Um, if both of the vectors have length one, then dot product is going to give you the cosine of the angle between them. That's just what that result ends up being. Um, what other things? That, like you might notice this looks similar to something you've done. In, if you've been doing kind of trigonometry or maths class recently, you probably have seen this kind of thing before in the form of when you were learning how to get the length of a vector. So if you have a, um, a vector you normally have to do, oh wow, that was being a bit weird. So you do, ooh, a bit laggy. Okay, x squared. Wow, that's actually really laggy. What the fuck? Hold on, then. Let's see what's going on. Okay. x squared plus y squared under a square root gives you um, the length of a 2D vector. And if it's 3D, you just have z squared on there as well. Now, if we get rid of this, what we've got is the length squared, which also means that if we remember we had the dot product was multiplying the x's x's by the y's z with z. That means the length squared is also the dot product of any vector with itself. So that's just another thing. If you need to get the length squared at any point, dot product of vector with itself. But we're interested in the case where they're both normal because that will give us the cosine of the angle, which gives us the number that we can use to smear our light out. So that's a lot of waffle. So we need to do something a bit more tangible and that means stop doodling and start coding. So down here, I'm gonna spread this out a little. And now we're gonna look at the diffuse component of our light. And so for starts, it's gonna be zero. And our light amount is then going to be ambient plus diffuse and then we're going to need a position for our light so uniform light pos and that's going to be a vector three it's going to be somewhere in the world so in world space we're going to be doing our lighting in world space now um that's not how you normally do your lighting um and not how a lot of tutorials were a lot of beginner tutorials will actually do it in world space because it's kind of simpler to deal with because you're not doing space conversions in your head while you're trying to pick up something. So we're going to do the same. Hopefully it helps. Okay, so we've got a light position and I'm going to just add a vector up here. Uh, yeah, called light pos. We can make a dedicated object for this later. We'll put it at zero and 30 and minus five. Maybe that'll do. Light pos. And then we're going to pass that into our shader. So we can do. Right, so that's in. If we want to check, we can actually just use the light position as a color for a second and just see what comes out. It's green. Um, no, there we are. So we need to know the direction from the point that we're drawing to the light. Okay, we, Entropy Ad's got a question. How do you do it normally? There's, I mean, there's a lot of different ways, um, I'm sure. But normally you would do it in clip space. Um, 
when you're doing this kind of shading because remember up here we took our um our world position for uh, the camera and the object and we transformed every the all the vertices into clip space so if we just pass the position through here we could work with everything in clip space um, that would also mean our camera position is at origin so we wouldn't have to think about uh, like we wouldn't have to do some of the little fiddly stuff we're going to do now to get the direction to the light um, also if you're doing um, lighting in clip space you've already brought all the objects nearer to your camera and trimmed out the ones you don't need so you're less likely to get floating point precision errors because if you imagine you've got a light like you've got your character here and you're seeing this stuff and then a mile away there's an object with a light near it now those floating point numbers for its position are going to be really big and when floating point numbers get really big or really really tiny um, they lose precision and then you can start getting some artifacts that change as you move and stuff like this and it's just ugh, so you don't want that so getting things into a space where the floating point numbers are in a sensible range means you're less likely to get errors which means less flickering more visual fidelity good stuff so yeah like it like in if we were going to do a slightly more advanced version of this tutorial we would do things in clip space and then when you're doing a bigger project you're probably moving things into local spaces where things make sense there was a yeah there was a really cool talk on um the train scene from one of the uncharted games and they were doing all their relative um all their their different um math relative to different things because this whole train essentially the level you're on is moving through an environment and there are things falling off the train so they're transitioning from this like reference space to the, the world's reference space oh it was great it was really cool and they talked about precision in there as well so sometimes you just need to reset the world and move everything back it's it's good stuff anyway this guy we now have yes we like for our diffuse we're going to need a direction to the lights which we're going to call a light deer ah that's a bit rubbish let's just do deer to light why do we have to give things stupid names right and say our light is up here and, and we our position is down here then we want this which means we need this to be positive so we're going to take the light position which at the moment is bigger and minus the object position okay so we'll do that do minus light pos from the frag position so this is the position of the fragment in world space so we need that information now luckily up in our first shader we have some of this stuff just under kind of bad names so we have a matrix here that transforms something from view space into clip space which means this must be a view position which means this is where that was made view pos in fact let's move this up here as well like there's no reason we can't just spread our code out of it da, 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 da. Um, and this is going to be clip position and we always return values from the vertex shader in clip space again excuse the big blocks of red if that's just me reminding myself not to screw up screw up tabs and spaces and all that junk right so we have a view space so this position was the world position and we transformed it from world to view space to get the view position so this is world pos which means this yes there we go so this was our position in model space and then we transform that with this matrix to get it into world space and then we carried on transforming it to get it into clip space now we want the world position in our fragment shader so we're just going to go down and stick it here compile this and then we're going to have to go change our fragment shader to get our world pos which is of x3 and now we're needing to lay things out differently um oh yeah we were going to call this frag pos weren't we fair enough that'll be fine um and then we compile this and we have to go and tell it that we're going to use the fragment stage that takes a vector three and it complains why is this not okay because we have 
a, this is actually a vector four at the moment. So all we're gonna do is swizzle this. If you haven't seen swizzling before, it takes a vector and lets you make a new vector with some of the components. So it's, uh, here we're taking this vector and we're taking the X, Y, Z components. So we'll get a vector three out of this. Compile, continue, and we're back to where we were, good. Except now we've got our world position in here as Fragpos. Let's see what's going on. <laughs> right. So we've got a direction to the light. So that was one of the things we needed. We have like a, we have a surface and we have a light and that has a direction. We have a point down here and a direction to the thing, direction to the light. We also need the normal to the surface. Now luckily, our normals are in, um, packed in with our vertex data. So they're also up here. So what we want to do is, let's, uh, now we're gonna return more values, let's lay this out differently. We need the normal. And we want that in world space. So we're gonna have to do the same transformation as we did before. So let's let's go and get our normal for a start. Um, normal is, I'm just gonna to jump to the definition of this struct um, so we can see what's in it. Uh, GPNT has a position, a normal, and um, text coordinates, which would be UVs or things like that. Um, <laughs> Shavara giving me shit. Like, uh, like, so apparently, all I have to do is have a game ready in, in just just over six, just, well, yeah, just around the sixth century mark from now. Well, at the rate we're going, I, if I just keep doing these videos, I'm going to just have to make a game because otherwise I won't have any content. That might be my only way to shut you up, is to actually just make a game here, so you can see that it happened. The world's slowest game, mate. Right. So that's what we've got. So we just need to call the uh, function norm, and that's going to give us the normal of the vertex data. So we're going to do it. Here we go. Norm vert. And because we need this over here, we're going to have the normal. This is a fragments normal. It's gonna be a vector three. We're gonna go down here and say, we'll use the fragment shader that takes a ve two vector threes. Everything's good so far, we can carry on. Now, there's a couple of details. Um, let's make a game with raining red cubes. Like, we're already there. Like, we just have to make this fun somehow. I, w I do actually want to turn like it seems we got the falling cubes. I'm going to do. I'm covering input a little bit later today, um, and I think it would just be nice to make a a little um, spaceship kind of thing. We can move around down the bottom and shoot bullets up, and then we can shoot these cubes. And then we'll probably have to cast some shadows down so we can see where the cubes are falling and stuff like that. But we could do that. That'd be fine. Um, so I think that's maybe we'll do that. <laughs> Elevator Simulator, please someone suggest Red Raining Cubes as the motto for the next Ludum Dare. Yeah, that's really, it's really pushing their, uh... <laughs> yeah, it's going to be challenging. Let's make the theme, the game that I already made. Right, so we've got a couple of details. Our normals are currently in model space, so they're... Like when you make a model in, in an editor, you normally have the model at the origin at zero, zero. And then in the game itself, we're going to move it around and we're going to rotate it, which means that normal when it was, that it was when the guy, like if you're making a character, it's normally kind of in this position, the normal from his arm, this arm will be going this way. But then when you're animating it in game, that normal is now going to be wrong. So we need to get the normal that's been transformed. And so we need to transform it into world space to start with. Now, um, a normal has no position, right? This is just a, a vector that represents uh, the direction from the surface. And so that means it's a vector three and ve our vector four, our model to world uh, matrix here, 
that's going to have a translation in it as well. We don't want translation. We don't want to treat this like a position and like tr move it around in the world. We just want to do the rotation part. Now, what we can do is we can call, um, so we're going to say a world normal. And we do want to times it by the model to world. And it's going to be the normal like that. But we're going to make a little change. We're going to call a function. Which is M4 to matrix 3. So this is taking a, a matrix 4 and chopping off the last column and the last row. And a 3x3 three three matrix is rotation. It also has some scaling there, but none of us have scaling, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, this is going to give us what we need. Um, Chimera is saying he's already stressed for the next Ludum Dare. Really, man? Like, you're in a, just a great place for doing that with your kit now. That sounds like you'd be like... Compared to, I mean, because you had an entry in what, I mean, one of the other times I was watching you build an entry, and that, and then trial was like a baby. Um, what was I doing? Yes, so we transform this into the, into the world space. So we'll pass that. And then, finally, we have our um, normal down here. We've got our direction to light. Now, what's interesting is I said that the dot product thing, getting the cosine of the angle between two vectors, only works if those vectors are both normal. So we need to normalize some things. So the direction to light. I'm going to call this vector light because it's really a kind of offset and the direction can be um, the normalized version. Yes. Normalized version of vector light. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say we're going to take the dot product of the two things. So the direction to the light and the fragment normal. And suddenly we have the ability to see we have cubes. Again, excuse me. We can see there are actually slightly different colors on the sides of these and the bottoms are a lot darker even black at these points so we are getting um some shadowing which is cool so we've got to start and if we can move the um light position around let's go and get that um let's set f oh no it was light position wasn't it uh, just Light position. So if we set light position to be zero, 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 and don't hit the wrong thing, Chris, and we can see now the bottom are, are very bright and the tops are very dark because now we've put the light way back down the ground. So now we can move it up. Let's put it at 20 and way over to the right. And we can see the lights now coming from here. So basically, we've got a Feeling that this is all right. It would be a little more obvious actually if we rotated all these cubes. So what we should do is just go loop. And this is some of the code we had last time. <laughs> can tell I clear hashes very often. Um, what we're going to do is we are going to rotate the thing. For everything that's in the things, rotate it by. And let's do a quaternion. And it's going to be, we want to make a quaternion from fixed angles. Vector 3, because we've already got Vector 3 here. Bam, bam, bam. And really doesn't matter uh, about where, what these numbers are. Just as long as they're random. Oh yeah, and they should be floats. There we are. They're all uh, different angles now. So that's cool. So we've got some ambient color and we've got some diffuse color. That's all we need for diffuse. Um... For now, it does not take care of reflection baggers, uh, right? So, um, were you, uh, Ponder Pen, were you referring to Shimera's stuff or, or this one? What we're doing here? Only direct light. Yeah, we've got a, we've got a point light and yeah, single point light and we're using ambient for the rest. So if we whack up the ambient, like suddenly everything's a bit better lit. Yeah, it's kind of nasty, but, uh. <laughs> Chimera is being optimistic. It's going to be a fucking train wreck with a dumpster fire cargo. That is hopefully driving straight into a burning pit. 
and he can feel it in his bones. Man, your bones must be amazing. Like, that's gonna be intense to feel like... What do your bones feel like? Oh, like a dumpster fire on the back of a burning train? Careering through a ravine of doom? That's, uh, that's heavy. You should probably get that looked at. I don't have a rendering engine at all. But you're... Ah, I don't know, dude. I, I think you'll be fine. I think you'll do good. We've got more than we've got at the moment. We've got falling cubes. We've got heavier rain. The pointy edition. Um, okay, so we have diffuse and we have ambient. The last thing we need for this model, for basic fong, is the specular component, which remember before was that bit that makes stuff shiny, like that bit. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. I am so good with cameras. Da da da. Yes. Oh man, I shouldn't. Um, I've been to. A... Dude, don't say stuff that dark because then when I laugh, it just seems like I'm an asshole. Because then I'll find out that it's true. And uh, yeah, it's. Oh, I, I hope you're watching better things than this if you've got three months to live. Um, yes, right. Specular. Let's do specular. So, what we're actually going to. The specular takes two things into account it takes where we're looking from and the direction to the light. So we're gonna need both of these. Luckily, we've got one already. We've got direction to light. We need the direction from the object to us, to the viewer. So, for, so that means we need the camera position. So let's go and add a uniform right here. It said cam position, and it's a back three. Cannot establish the type of specular. Yeah, that's true. They haven't done anything here, so. Uh, the type system would struggle in this case. Uh, specular, and let's just add it to the, the formula, so it has, we've got it now. Okay. So now we need to calculate specular, and for that we need the camera position. So we've compiled this, so we should have campos available. We go down here, and as well as light pos, we now need to pass in camera position. Um, and, oh yeah, and now we've got to look at our cameras, so it would be cool if we could split this code out a little. So I want to have this be some camera. I'm going to take this map G and we're going to say draw thing. And we're going to pass in a thing and we're going to pass in a camera. And then, right now, I don't know what camera we're using. We'll find out in a second. Draw thing. Thing with a camera. Oh yeah, there we are. We've been using this one. Hey, some camera objects. We'll pass that in. And up here, we will now swap this out for the camera variable. And we need the position of the camera. If we inspect that object, we can see it has a position and a rotation. So we'll get pos of camera. That's fine. So we can do pos of camera. And well now, do, do, do. maybe this will compile. Yes, and then we can go down here and say draw thing, passing in that. Everything still works. We are not in the dumpster fire yet. Okay, cool. So now we can just focus on this. Um, now we've got the camera position. We can do the same thing as we did up here, where we did. Oh no, it was down here. Fragment shader. We can take the vector to light. We're going to do a vector and a direction. So we're going to do vector to cam and direction to cam. So that's going to be the cam, no, nope. cam pos. And it's vec to cam. So now we've got those compiled. <laughs> um, I can't believe. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Amado, you probably see, won't see that game, <laughs> game then, Shimera. I can't make up the sarcasm or not. It's it, it's it's always sarcasm. That's um, if if, if Shimera stops being sarcastic, that actually means he's dead. So then he's got no months. <laughs> I mean, that guy came to the chat with fart.ogg. You can't be serious. Indeed. Indeed. And now we've got screaming waves. Excellent. Yeah, just don't don't trust the URLs, man. I'm, I'm, I've am I'm left them open as an experiment because they're 
they're on a completely separate machine. So if I open a link and it fucks the computer, it's the streaming computer. It just goes down. You don't get to see any of the glory other than, you know, the stream dies, which could be pretty cool, I suppose. Let's not encourage this behavior. Let's get back to this. So what we're going to do now, let's see if I can sketch it because I need to remember how this works. We have another vector to our camera. This is a camera. Can you tell? Look at that. It's the most camera thing I've ever drawn. So we've got a vector going this way. Doot, doot. And we've got a vector going that way and we've got the vector up. Um, and so what we do is we are going to... Oh man, I could have actually, I should have drawn this in a slightly different position for a reason. And now let's uh, draw this up here. We're going to stick our cam... <laughs> stick our camera up here. Da, 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 da. Camera. What we want to do is we want to take the light direction, and this time we are going to reverse it. It's going to be coming this way because we want to calculate the reflection. And the reflection is getting off this way. And then when we know what direction the reflection is going, we can do the same trick as before and get the angle between the reflection and the camera vector. And then we're going to use that to base our specular on. So see how this is going to take into account not just the way um, the light's coming from, but also the way we're looking from. Grab anything that's mildly shiny in your house and do this experiment. So you can just move your head and see that the specular part of the reflection, it matters where you look at it from because it's your relationship to that light. Whereas the other stuff is weak enough that you can you can miss it, you know? Mouse! Out of doodle mode. Let's doodle. So we are going to reflect something. So we need a reflection. Um, and that is, we're going to call the handy function reflect that comes with GLSL. So we've got this already. And we are going to, like I said, we're going to negate the light direction. So what's that? Vec to, no, dear to light. Oh, and I've remembered something. We're going to have to go in to look at, someone remind me about normals in a minute after this bit, because the normals are wrong and I need to show why. Um, we're going to nate, negate, nate, sure, we'll nate the vector. Beautifully nated, um, the vector will then be reflected around the normal. Normal, 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 normal. Where's our normal? Oh yeah, it's frag normal, that's it. This gives us a reflection, and then we can dot product, just like we did before. We're calculating the angles between the... I mean, I, I mean, we should... We should... Ah, let's just normalize it, just in case. The dot product between our reflection and our direction to camera. And then, finally... What are we going to do? All right, here's a, here's a good point. Before we go under normals as well, da, 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 right? Cosine function, terribly drawn cosine function will look like this, right? There's this whole negative part. We don't want negative colors, and so what we're going to do is we're going to clamp it in the range zero to one. It's never going to go above one anyway, so we can just clamp it. So we could, we could either just take the max with zero, but I've already got a saturate function. It looks kind of nice. So we're going to use that. And that's going to chop off the negatives. And then we'll, we're never going to get an angle which is going to give us this part. So we will only then have this bit that we need. And then it will go black. So we dot products, we saturate. And now we've got a bit more light on them. But the specular parts are generally smaller. So what we're going to do is we are going to... And this might seem weird because it's hard. Like, I'm going to... We're going to need to graph this in a minute to see what's going on. Um, we are going to raise this to the power. Actually, we'll do it in the Lisp way, which is the EXPT. Same thing. Um, we're going to raise it to the power of 32. And... Then... Was there something else I needed to do? Hmm. It might be it. Oh yeah, then we might want to multiply it by another number, which is the specular power. It's just another fudge number, so specular power. And for now, we're just going to set that to be 1. 
because that's fine. Now, technically we've got it, but it's a little hard to see. So let's move around until we can see some stuff. Oh, yeah, one of the reasons it might be wrong um, is to do with our normals. And so we should look at that first. Um, the problem is we passed our normals from our vertex shader to our fragment shader. And that's cool, right? So we have, we coming out of the vertex shader, we have the points of our triangles. So here's a triangle and then, you know what? Let's do this the sensible way. Let's draw a goddamn triangle first, a rough triangle, very rough. And then do the points. So we've got our points are what are coming out of our vertex shader and we stick data on each point. So if we say this is one and this is two, right? Then when this is being turned into fragments, it's gonna interpolate these, this value between there and there. So when we return the normal for each um, vertex, it's then gonna interpolate that vector with a linear interpolation between the points. And this is fine for floating point numbers, right? So halfway between this and this will be 1.5. If this one was zero, then halfway between zero and one is 0 0.5, yada, yada. In the middle, we'll have different values, which I'm not gonna do. Um, and that's cool, but linear interpolation and normals is kind of strange. So if we have, here's a normal, and this is gonna be tricky to draw, I think. Let's have a normal and a normal. I'll see if this comes out all right. Right, so linear interpolation means it's going to be interpolating along this line. So halfway is easy. We've got this. Halfway between there oops, is here. Halfway between there is to here. And it's gonna, we might have to find a better picture. The The problem is as we get, um, because we're interpreting linearly across here, the angle, uh, problem is it's hard to just, just take away from my bad drawing. The gap between um, here and here and here and here is, is different basically. So the interpolation is linear here, but we're getting Basically, our normals are being shortened. Like this one's this long, one long, one long. By the middle here, this is what, 0 0.7? Um, it's a different length because we're interpolating between these two points. Really, an interpolation would be like twisting the normal, like this. So instead of doing a twist, we, we've got, let's see if I can do it on, on camera. We've got this kind of thing going on. And so it's getting chopped off on the bottom of my stream here, like, right? So we want something that actually takes a flock. Anyway, it means our normals are incorrect when they reach the other side. They're the wrong length. So all we need to do is normalize them. Man, I explained that badly. Never mind. We will continue. So frag normal has to be normalized. And then it should be a little better. Now let's go and have a look at our camera again. The position of the camera, set F, the Z of the position of the camera to minus four. Whoa, that's not a single float, you're very correct. Let's try it again and continue. Um, yeah. And let's stop time for a second so we can actually have a look at an object. Da, 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 da. Um. This will be a lot better when we have our input system hooked up. Oh, the nice mind skills. Thank you, sir. They weren't, but thank you anyway. Right. Um. She's very distracting everyone again. Good job, sir. They can't see me screw up if they're looking at you. Um, wow, yeah, Jesus. 
Oh, I love having you folks in the chat. This is grand. Right. Um, <laughs> that's all right. Cool. Hey, if I want an example of a specular, I should just have my shiny head. That would have been better. Don't know why I didn't think of that before. Right. That's a... <laughs> Let's get back over here. Right, position. X position. Ah, oh, come on. It's just. I was hoping to get away with not dealing with input before a little bit later in the stream. But it might be necessary if this gets too annoying. What I need is... Oh, actually, let's just start moving this light around for a start because that would make things a little easier to see. So where is our light pass? Let's go down here where we're drawing and we can just update it. So let's set the um, lights position, which is light pass 2B. A vector where we sign now, um, that's going to be a big number, but we'll deal with that in a minute. We'll put it at 20 and then we'll take cosine of now. Okay. Oh yeah, that's this value will be very small right now, so let's times it by 20. 20. Oh, that's actually not horrendous. So we've got it moving around. I'm starting to wonder if I've forgotten something here because this isn't looking very much like we've got specular. Um, let's turn off the ambient lights and, oh yeah, let's just remove ambient and diffuse light for a second and just have the specular. Okay, so it's there. You have some specular stuff going on. In fact, that could actually be doing with going a bit faster. Uh, that'll be times 10 now. This will be too fast. That was unbound. Well, if I'm not in the let scope, that will happen. Right. Whoa. Okay. Strange that not all the objects seem to be getting affected by that. I wonder if. Will it be raining? No, I wonder if I've screwed something up here. Good chance of it. I think it might be time to go and look at some docks. Hmm. All right. No problem. Let's go over here to the basic lighting tutorial. Maybe I'll just jump into GL resources quickly. Okay, so... Hmm. I'm actually going to be using this for... I'm just wondering how to present this because I'm... Basically, I was meant to do these as separate videos and they didn't. So I'm going to just link people to partway through this stream instead. So if you're just joining us now, hello! Um, I got some questions about resources for learning GL stuff. And there are two, basically. I found that don't suck. The first one is learnopengl.com. It is wonderful. Um, and it goes through a lot of stuff, all the way from the basics up to some of the more advanced stuff. I've been trying my image-based lighting from here recently. Um, it is, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't praise this enough. Brilliantly written. Um, all the code's available on GitHub. It's not a complete mess of custom libraries. I, I'm, I like this thing. Um, but... There is another tutorial I actually think is better um, for when you're just just starting out. And the reason it's better is because the guy who wrote it forces you into slightly uncomfortable positions um, when you start. So he gets you to do a few things that are slightly more tricky. So it used to be on a site called arcsynthesis.com. And that site's gone now. But what you can do is if you search for arc synthesis, I should really, arc synthesis, bit bucket, this second link down here, 
If you then go to downloads, which are somewhere, downloads, right next to my cursor, and then download the tutorial files. Um, this stuff is awesome. So let's uh, downloads and then tutorial. I've already got it unzipped. There is a PDF. Um, that's for Kindle. Let's print black and white. Yeah, this guy, this guy is brilliant. And he goes all the way through all that stuff about clip space and all that is in here. And yeah, that was one of the things that when I was starting out, again, it's very simple C. It's not burdened down with a ton of other libraries. It's, um, it gets you to deal with spaces earlier on than you might expect. It very much ignores old style GL, except to point out where things overlap and might be confusing. Um, it treats textures as like places for storing data, not just as images. You only does images later. It's, I, I think this is such a good place. If you want to learn modern GL, this, this is brilliant. And then pair that with uh, learnopengl.com for a slightly friendlier. It eases you in a bit more in some places. But I think this is actually more beneficial. It, it really hits you with some of the ugly shit of uh, OpenGL because OpenGL's API is ugly. And so if you want to get to know it, I recommend this over everything else. Those two resources are the best I know of for getting into GL. And Keppel started out as me just doing the um, Arc Synthesis tutorials. I would do a, the tutorial chapter, do the code at the end of the chapter. And when I got to the end of it, there was very like writing C and Lisp. Um, I would just go, okay, what sucks most about this? And then we take the thing that sucks most and abstract it and then do the next tutorial and take the thing that sucks most out of that. And that's how the, all the basics for Keppel grew. So yeah, those are the, those are the resources, resources I recommend. So we're going to look at the basic lighting one here. And we will see, oh, look at all these pictures. These are way better than the ones I was drawing. I should, could have just shown you those, but then I don't get doodle and that's just not acceptable. So that was notes on scaling, which we don't need to worry about yet. Okay. Did I not saturate it? No, I did. So you dot the reflection and the view direction. And then, you know what, that seems, hmm. Um, and then you raise it to the power, 32, and that's your specular, times it by specular strength. Yep. And then times it by light color. We don't have a light color yet, so that's fine, because it would just be one. So we're not missing anything there. Specular power is way too high, obviously, but I mean, that shouldn't be the major problem right now. Um, let's just check that I didn't get this wrong. No, that actually is looking worse. Oh no, did I change that? No. Now this will actually be a little easier to see with spheres. So let's, um, Let's do cube stream um, and then do setter cube stream to be the buffer stream. And let's go and change the buffer stream to be sphere GPU arrays. And do that. Okay. Oh, yeah, there it is. Speculars on the wrong side. Which means that difference vector was wrong. There it is. Now our specular is there. If we tone down the diffuse for a second, so easy when you can just fuck around with stuff. There you can see the uh, specular component, just lovely and shiny right there. Ah, I see why that was looking a bit weird. My light, oh, I'm an idiot. Okay, light pass is, is in the positive direction. Remember that when you're working in camera space, Minus Z is forward and plus Z is backwards. He's a thinker. Okay. So we should actually do uh, 
yeah, minus 10. How about that? There we go. That's a bit better. Do 50, 14. Sure. That's the one we hit. That's looking a bit more like stuff. Let's get to that point 0.4 again. Remove that, because that's not correct. Get our ambient back in, and we have... Nothing. Is that ambient that week? Maybe it is. No, that can't be right. Oh, I can I can see something. If if that it's that dark when we're making it the ambient that high, that means we are not saturating something somewhere. I think we've got a dot product without a saturate because that means we have exactly those negative colors that we were talking about before. So that's not good. There we are. That looks a bit better. Right. So that's our very basic Fong lighting. And you can see, look at that specular component when it comes around there. It wraps just around the edge. That's nice. That's what we want to see. Okay, questions on the thing. Real-time rendering. Yeah, real-time re That book. Oh, man. Actually, if, if we... I should have brought... Did this, done this in the resources section. Maybe I'll give them two links. Uh, uh, yeah, right. I recommend those two because obviously they're free and brilliant, but um, Essential Mathematics uh, for Games and Interactive Applications. This book is really useful. RTG math is heavily based on what's in here. This is the book that got me to understand vector spaces and all sorts of things. I'm still using it all the time. Um, lovely book. Lovely, lovely, lovely. And then real-time rendering. Someone mentioned this. This book is so good. It's so good. Right, there's just so much avant shit in here. Um, you, can, you can almost see this as an, an index of the papers that you want to read. This will give you so much information. And then tons of links. Just so many links out to other resources and papers where all this knowledge came from and where it's going. This book is just, it's just dream. And it's again, this is the third edition. I'm sure the fourth edition's out now as well. My copy of Essential Maths is second edition. Check the errata. That's very important because you'll occasionally find bugs. I did. Um, right. Pom de Pimp recommended awesome OpenGL. Hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, there's a lot of good resources it looks like there. Um, I mean, some of them like SDL and stuff like that is, yeah, of course, you need some of that, mass libraries. Um, but I, I mean, this, these are, yeah, these are great resources. I would have overwhelmed the shit out of me if I was new coming in, because, uh, yeah, I, I struggled for quite a while. Um, so yeah, thanks Npren for the real-time rendering reference. That is, that is well recommended. Uh, by the way, this, the, is the code from the stream online somewhere? If not, would you mind putting, uploading it somewhere? I think it is. I, ooh, let's check. I did at least have this in a repo. Yeah, save this. Um, oh no, I haven't pushed it online yet. Okay. Otherwise, I'll forget. Let's do that now. Um, new repository. What do we call this? Playing with verts? Play with verts. Something like that. Yeah. Play with verts. Description, yada yada yada. From, nope, through the stream. From the stream. Da da da. And we need this. Push upstream master origin. It's online. So 
yeah, go to my um, GitHub and look for Play With Verts. This is what we had last week, and I'll push our stuff after this stream. Um... Hey, young Lena, good to see you. I thought we'd scared you off last time when the maths just went completely mental. Because um, that clip space stuff was weird. And I, I, I chatted to someone from my work who watched the stream as well and who informed me that, yeah, I, I haven't got the description of that down very well. Um, I, will, I will try and have a go at coming up with a better way of that because it's stuff that I've got in my head but not, not well enough to teach. Um... Ramp up the specular power. Actually, we will play with specular power in a second then, Peren. We'll definitely do that. Um, can you add to the description of your video and YouTube's links to the books or website? I will try and remember that. I will try and remember that. Yes, I should write that down. I should write it down. But what have I got to write things down on? This board, maybe? Always have a handy whiteboard. Right. Um, that's notes from other stuff. Let's... Um, I could just write it down in the text editor, but I'm just going to lose it with everything else. Right, um, yeah, notes. Oh yeah, that was books, wasn't it? Books! Don't be sensible! Org mode. I haven't actually got into that yet. It always, it's just seemed a bit heavyweight for me right now. I end up just sticking everything in markdown files, but I should, I, maybe I should invest the time. We'll see. Um, yeah, we should actually get together like a little little pile of Lesby resources. Palm to palm. It's a good idea. Um, nice. And then, is there anything else I missed? Thanks for the, um, adding the links, Edge Piad. That was awesome. Um, org mode capture, just amazing. Okay, I will have to look into that at some point. It is now on the list of things I should do. Right. So. Um, currently re-rendering with the buff stream. Which is a sphere. Where do we use that? Buff stream. Of course we do it in the map G up here. So now we can just go to the... Oh no, it was cube stream. Now we got this right. It's a little, I mean, it's a lot subtler on flat surfaces because the angles, it's hitting everything at once. One of the things we don't have in here is attenuation. Like, it doesn't matter how far away the light is, it's always the same strength, which is kind of weird. That's, well, it's wrong. Wrong is what it is. So, I mean, the light strength, um, where is it? Like, a light attenuates based on the square of the distance. So what we would do is we would take the vector to the light and the length of this. Um, and so we would take, yeah, I guess we would, maybe we could do it down here. We have light amount. Um, vector to the light and then we square that. And then we divide light amount by that, maybe? Now that's suddenly going to make everything rather dark. Whoa. There's no vector light in this environment. Oh, there's no function. Yeah, that's damn right. Muppet. Okay. Can't raise this to the thing of that. Can we not? I probably haven't defined that. That's silly of me. Okay, we'll just use power for now because that, that, that should work. Um, continue. Really? Power and vec3 and int. Oh, okay, maybe I just... Is it as simple as... Nope, it's not as simple as that. <laughs> vec3 to float. Okay. Um, then what is it not liking? Um, oh, as soon as it's square, let's just do... We should be able to do that, can't we? Oh, wait a second, what am I doing? Um, we want... Ah, uh, I am just being a Muppet. Length of the vector to light to the power of two. 
Why? Now everything's dark because we've clamped everything down so much. Um, so that's kind of annoying. So now really we want the the strength of the light to be higher so it actually reaches things. And I'm not sure what we should... See, like now, now we've got things that are further away from the light are darker. Um, and that's cool, at least. But um, I'm going to take attenuation out for now because what I, if, if we introduce it, I would like to introduce it properly. Um... So we've got this. We've got our kind of clunky version. Um, when we're doing attenuation as well, often even though the um, square, like having it drop off by the square of the distance is the physically accurate way of doing it, you probably just want to do a linear fall off and play with a load of things like that. So give yourself artistic, like give yourself enough control so you can be artistic with light fall off, I suppose is the tip there. Um, Cool. Young Lena, is Lisp a pain to set up on any Windows OS? No, actually. Um, it's not too bad. I've got a video on my YouTube channel about that. Um, or oh, I'm fond of him. Might actually be linking to it. Nope. Oh no, this is the ELS stuff. Yeah. Um, European Lisp Symposium uh, videos are up now, which is really cool. I've got a couple of those I need to rewatch. I was lucky enough to be there for that one. Uh, list related very much young lady let me just get you the link to the video because i think it's one of the better videos for getting set up um oh fucking, what is it baggers common lisp windows there we go um Get this chat stuff back. There we go. Uh, try that. As long as I don't need Emacs. Ugh! Yeah, you pretty much do. It's Emacs or Vim, really, to be honest. Um, the editor situation for... Lisp right now is is a bit of a bummer because part of what makes this so good is the the tight integration between the editors and the REPL. Like in in my personal opinion, if if the if Slime didn't exist, which is the thing that connects Emacs and um, and the server side, like the the language server, I wouldn't use Lisp. Like using Lisp from an et, from like you need an editor that has good support for like closing all your parens and moving around by parens so you can do things like just simple stuff like um, dragging parens backwards and forwards and then popping an outer paren like that. Um, just that stuff is moving like basically editing structurally rather than with just with characters makes such a huge difference. Um, but yeah, sorry, uh, Entropy Ads pointed out something very good. There is also Sly. Uh, which is an alternative to slime, but again, Emacs, um, I think. Slim V um, isn't too bad if you use Vim, that's very true. I know people using Slim V. There is, um, actually, there is one option coming up which I'm really hoping will become good. If you've got JavaScript slash CoffeeScript experience and you can help a dude out, um, where is the Atom Slime plugin? Alright, there is a dude working on this um, let's get the links into the chat that is the wrong chat program um, there we go this guy has been doing good work he's making very slow progress overall uh, but it's just that he's basically doing a lot of this stuff on his own there was someone else who uh, contributed stuff for the disassembler recently or no for the profiling if Atom becomes good enough to do Lisp stuff on, I will do introductory um, Lisp videos using Atom. I want there to be that third option. I don't care if it's um, Atom or if it's VS Code. One of those two would be perfect. Just an editor that's actually decent for working with text, that actually understands text and lets you extend things. 
I, I don't understand how it has been so hard for some other editors to be able to do that well. Um, but yeah, young lady, I really yeah keep an eye on that atom plugin because that would be cool. The bit that he doesn't have right now, I don't think, is um, really good debugger um, integration. And wh whenever I'm screwing something up over here, um, like I can just break things here and we drop into the debugger and we get stack traces and we can restart code and carry on. His stuff isn't quite there yet. Um, so yeah, that, that really matters to me. Also, um, I'm just going to type something in. Oh, I haven't typed it in chat. Peridit. It, like, if I recommend using it, that's the thing that lets you move um, parens around structurally. It is also available in Atom and in VS Code, I think. Um, it's awesome, and you'll hate it for the first couple of... Well, I hated it for the first couple of days. I really struggled to just get used to, like, when you backspace... A paren, it doesn't go away because you're you're not editing that structure like that. You edit, you delete characters. If you want to get rid of parens, you pop, and it is. Or you can delete the entire block in one go. Or if like, when you get to, when you have nothing left in it, then it'll go away. You know. Really recommend getting the hang of per edit. That is um, that's a huge deal. Right. Slightly distracted. Yeah, Markamatu, uh, there's slime for Atom, but it's a bit shit right now. Yeah, that's the one I was... Uh, that's the one. Oh, but he's but he's getting there. He's really getting there. I'm so glad he's working on this. Um, can you change things like copy-pasting, Control-C in Emacs? Yes. I don't know how. It's one of those things that Control-C in... Because, because everything... A lot of stuff is driven by... Uh, like multiple key presses so your multiple key binding control c starts so many different moves that you wouldn't want it to be copy copy is one of the things you'll be doing but it's not so important that you need to sacrifice that control c is so comfortable for starting something you control x or control c and then the next character means a lot of different things um yes that's uh so i, I would recommend don't change that but if you use Atom, the default is Control-C as copy anyway. So, I mean, I, w I would recommend checking out Atom. Maybe to begin with playing. I haven't checked the Keppel stuff in there to how stable it is. But we'll see, I guess. Yeah, Pomdevimps linked um, Kua mode, CUA mode. I don't know what the thing is, but... Um, I don't know. I, I just find those, to be honest, I find those things make Emacs more confusing, not less confusing. Um, anytime you change an environment so far from the normal, suddenly you can't look up as much information because everything's a bit weird. So I know Emacs is full on customized. Every, your, your Emacs can be different from everyone else's Emacs, but there is still a limit. So uh, yeah, maybe try, maybe try the Atom. See what you think. It's kind of important because, um, like, if you're using SBCL, which is a phenomenal Lisp um, Lisp implementation, then its console, its REPL, is terrible. Like by design, they don't they they don't think that anyone uses it like that because no one does. Um, so they make something that is just functional enough to get started, but nothing more. Um, so really, yeah, if you're doing stuff just from the default ship with it REPL, you'll have a bad time. HBAD uh, linked Ergomax key bindings. Yeah. Yeah, Chimera, I'm I'm yeah, I'm, I'm like you know, I'm I'm with you on that one. Cool. Right, so we have some basic lighting, but it's a bit gash at the moment. We need to do this slightly better. First off, I mean, our color is really boring because it's just red. Uh, so the first thing we'll do is we'll get some textures in here. Now, one of the things I did steal from this lovely tutorial was they had another tutorial on lighting maps. And the basic premise is we can have a texture for the surface colors. 
But we can also have a texture, like this one, saying how shiny different parts of the object are. Basically, how um, much specular power there will be. So we're going to mess, we're going to use this to set the specular, um, the specular power, and we're going to use the other one to set the object color, and we'll see what we get. So I have gone and downloaded those things. So if we go to downloads and container albedo, we have that one. And if we do container, what is it, specular, we have that one. And this is grayscale, so everything's going to be going between 0 and 1, right? Like black to white. So black is going to be no specular. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, remember we, we're doing some open jail stuff. Yeah, we got a bit distracted there. Start talking about Emacs and just, oh, just have to go off and rant for a while. That is the affliction. Right, so let's just make a couple of textures. Um... Def var, um, we are going to have a albedo sampler, and then we are going, and that's going to be nil, and then we're going to have an R, a specular sampler. So we got those two, and we'll take those forms and get things, some things set up here, down here. So say, unless albedo sampler, then set of albedo sampler to be ah oh, we're gonna need another library quick load dirt um let's pull that in let's actually add this to the project depends on dirt dirt is a so there is a library called cl soil which is a which is a wrapper around a brilliant c library called soil uh, for image loading, loads things straight to textures or into array, into uh, foreign like arrays and stuff like this. Um, I then added dirt, which is just a tiny wrapper around that, which gives two extra functions, and it's basically just load textures into Keppel C arrays or into Keppel um, textures, just so you get the right object back and you don't have to do any farting around yourself. So we are going to go down to here and we say dirt load image to texture and then we are going to just go and find that so it's downloads uh, actually we should just we should move those files because that's not going to help you guys later on downloads container mark those move those to play with birds and yep and then go to this now we've got them in here, and then we'll do ASDF system relative path name and relative to play with verts. We are going to get the container albedo. And because this is a sampler, we also need to sample that texture. Let's check if that worked. Whoa, did I copy that right? We'll see. Yep, that worked. And then we'll do this exact same thing again, but it's the specular sample sampler that we are doing. Um, container, oh, it's just specular. Okay. Yep, those are populated now. And our code's fine. Right, so now we want to get these into our fragment shader. So we're doing it the same way as we'd always do them. There's a albedo sampler. Oops, 2D. Don't need that anymore. And a spec uh, so We'll call it a specular map. Just to have some name differentiation there. And then down in our drawing, we need to pass these things in. So let's go and do that. So we are going to have a specular map, which is the specular sampler and the albedo, which is the albedo sampler. Right, that's in. 
Let's see, and now we can start using it. First off, object color is currently red, so let's get rid of that, and let's do texture of the albedo. And now we need some UV coordinates. Um, we need some texture coordinates to say where to look up into a texture. If you've seen this before, you probably have. Um, if you have a texture, in this case, sorry, if, if we have an image and we're gonna be querying things out of this image, we have a texture, um, you query it from zero, zero being the bottom left to one, one being the uh, top right. And normally meshes will have UV coordinates, which tell you where to look in a texture to find the thing that you're looking for. So um, we are, we do have those. Those are also in our GPU array. Oops. From earlier, let's just pull this again and we can see where that is. Pull G that. See that last column right here? That's the UVs. So we've already got them to the GPU, we just need to pass them from the vertex stage to the fragment stage. Jobs are good. So we will do this and it's called UV and it's texture. If we go and want to just be sure, we can jump here and we can see that the texture um, component of this struct has an access to called text. So we use text, compile that. We're going to also pass this down to the next stage, which just freaked out. Mismatch between shader stages. Wonder why that didn't catch it sooner. The fact it's a GL crash like that is nasty. Um, I will look into what that was at some point. But right now it's no big and we haven't lost everything. Um, there is no argument for the texture with sample 2D? Yeah, it very much is. Oh yeah, that's because we need to use UV here. Um, so we can get rid of that and carry on. And then we've still got this error waiting, so nothing's happening yet. Um, we need to go and now tell it that we are using the one that takes a VEX2 as well as the other VEX. And we say continue, and now we've got texturing. Cool. So we've got our cubes, and they've got the textures on them. Um, but the specular is the same all the way across the object. So let's just let's bump up the specular so we can actually have that be a problem for us. Let's just set it to three. So specular power is three, and then when you see where it comes across an object, like especially this guy here, really shiny on the wood. The wood shouldn't be that shiny. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to take our specular map, and we're just going to set the specular power to be. And let's do uh, we'll just do it as it is. Texture, specular map, UV. And it's freaking out because now our specular power is, oh yeah, is a vector four. And we only need, because it's grayscale, it means all the components are the same. So we don't need to use all of them. We'll just take one of them. And now we should be able to see, now it's quite subtle. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make it ugly. Um, I'm good at ugly, we can do this. You might see that there is a glint on the metal parts of the boxes, um, but maybe you don't, and that wouldn't be surprising. So let's let's multiply the specular power by four. And now, hopefully, as the light goes past, we'll see some glinting. You see some glinting there. As things come up to one, um, and that's the purpose of our specular map. Let's uh. Let's do something silly. We'll swap out the um, the mesh for um, a sphere again. Where was that? Oh, in draw. There we go. In buff stream. It might actually be more more visible now. Let's uh, yeah. Let's move the camera a bit. Pass of the camera is not written like that, and then we. Set up. Whoa. Ah, oh, that was just stupid. Set up. Minus 420. Oh, there's a good example. So we can see on here no shininess in the wood, but look at that specular as it goes across the metal. 
And that's what we were after. And back there especially. That's great. So, uh... Let's go. Minus five. Problem is, obviously, as we move around, we're changing our position, which changes the specular. But, you know, it'll work. We, again, we will have input soon, and this will make this... Well, we do have input now, but I just haven't shown it yet, so it's, uh, yeah. Let's look at the chat. Holy cow! That's some long posts. You can tell people are talking about editors. Okay. Oh man, Space Max coming into the picture as well. Jesus. I I don't know what the seller Space Max is. And that's not a like Space Max is pointless. I literally don't know. I haven't looked into it. It's like um, yeah, Chimera, the, the advice of just forcing yourself to use it for a while. I tried that with Vim and Emacs, because it felt like those two got so much chat that I had to try one of them. So I just, I, I forced myself to use Vim for a while, and I never got past, I never got the key bindings to feel natural. And then I started using Emacs, and they felt more natural, so I just stayed there. That was my most scientific method of just like, oh, this sucks a little bit less, so I'll keep doing this. But yeah, it was it was painful at first. But I swear by now, I love it. But uh, I can totally understand people not wanting to do that. And to be honest, to me, Emacs versus like VS Code and things like that, I don't really care. I mean, it just has to be an editor that that is all about text. It's a text editor that works in text. Emacs is amazing at that. Vim is great at that. Um, Adam is seems to be very good at that too. It's like the whole Git Mercurial thing. Um, is it Mercurial? Yeah. Like, it's distributed version control. Like, that's the right answer. Which one you use is, there are details of which one's better, but and there's opinions there as well. But as long as you're using distributed version control, at least you're on the right, you're in the right place. And it's the same with text editors. Like, as long as you're in a text editor that fundamentally understands how to work with text and uses text first, kind of, as a proper citizen, yeah. Ah, oh, anyway, why am I ranting about this? Anyway, um, da, 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 da. yeah, young lady, if you're gonna look into it as well, there's some, there's some good videos which I've forgotten now. Oh God damn it, what was it called? There's a guy called Jekor, J E K O R, and he had some really nice Emacs videos. I, I used them a lot when I was. Uh, yeah, uh, Pom de Pimp mentions the package manager. Definitely use the package manager. Again, Jacko has a great video on setting up the package manager with Melpa, and that's super handy. Um, but I really want Atom, like Lisp on Atom, to be good because I can, and then I can, like, the, the sell for like trying out Lisp is less hard. Look at this cool stuff. We can do this in an ad so you already use. Um, phone of him. Too late, man. I'm, I'm, I, I was scrolled up and then I've just been working through. I should have looked at the warnings first. Don't look at the chat. Oh, yes. Oh, well, I've added my boring nerd talk to the boring nerd chat. Um, cool. Elisp is awesome. Ugh, I don't like Elisp that much. I really don't. Maybe I just don't have a setup where it doesn't suck, but god damn. Um, right, anyway. Oh. Hacks of Dev. Hey, man. Good to see you. Wait a second. How many people we got watching now? There's, if there's... Hold on. There's like more than five or six. What? That's a ridiculous number of people. Surely you've got better things to do. Anyway, ridiculous number. Like nearly 10. 10 whole people and one bot. Nine whole people. Anyway, I'm happy. I'm happy about that. Okay, so we've got our lighting. We've got specular and we've got uh, diffuse. So let's let's go through those components again. We were doing a stream on something, weren't we? Right, so we, we started out. We have Fong uh, shading. Which splits the lighting situation up into three parts. And um, 
<laughs> Gotta not look at the chat for a few seconds so I can focus. The um, the ambient, which is the light coming from everywhere, that's a constant number. So when we light things with that, everything just looks as it is. There we go. Lighting from all directions is the same. Then we have a diffuse part. And the diffuse part takes into account the light's position. And then we get these really hard shadows because there's literally no light over here. And then we have, and that, like, so that is the light that's, yeah, the, the kind of stuff that, that has that directional quality. And then we've got specular, which is the uh, component of the reflection that where it depends on where you're viewing from as well as the light position. Um, and then we add these together. And again, now we have specular and diffuse, but again, really hard blacks back there. So we throw in the ambient light and then we have something that could be believable if it was, you know, the first half-life. Um, so yeah, that's where we are. Like, um, and then, of course, then we use textures to say where it would be shiny. So that's, um, so that's awesome. So that is our basic fong lighting. That's what I wanted to cover um, first. Holy shit, it's like 9.41. How did that happen? I talked slowly and we were all distracted today. Bad us. No, who cares? Questions, things for me to go over, anything like that. Um, and then we will do a little bit more other stuff. We talked about GL resources already, so one other thing uh, we need to. One of the things from our list is already done. Um, let's. So we'll get on to the some other stuff in a minute. Okay. Doesn't sound like any burning questions. Fourteen people. Holy cow! Ah, oh, Ferris Stream stuff is hosting you. Oh well, that's just awesome. Uh, yeah, you should all check out Ferris Stream stuff as well. It's my mate from work. He's. His stuff's great. He's currently doing a Virtual Boy emulator in Rust. It's so cool. Chasing down the nastiest bugs. So he has two streams a week. One on Thursday. Uh, is it Thursday? Yes, Thursday. Thursday he does... Uh, Thursday at 8 o'clock Norway time, which is basically the same time I stream on Thursday. He does the um, Virtual Boy stuff. We're currently hunting down a real fucker of a bug. One of the last big remaining bugs in the emulator. And then on Sunday, he does a demo scene type, type stream. You should check that out too. That's really good. See graphics done by someone who actually knows what the fuck they're doing. That's, that's the key. That's the only bit I need to get to now. And then these will be good. Right. So that's, um, that's where we are there. What else do I want to talk about? Ah, yes. So this is uh, unrelated. So again, this is, I've put, um, I'll be linking to people into this video so for the other people who have just arrived on youtube hello um i wanted to talk about uh, threads and slime so when we're editing list when we've got this lovely environment we have a few things going on we have a uh, common list running and it's running a little server called swank um and then emacs connects to it um via yeah there's a there's a library called slime so the client is Slime, the server is Swank. I will get this information out eventually. Now, Slime, if I just, I'm just gonna say Slime list threads, if that's what it was called. Slime runs a few threads that, to help it, things, so it offloads some of the work. So it's gonna run your REPL on one thread. It's gonna run stuff for handling indentation apparently, uh, some stuff with a reader, D different jobs on different threads, perfectly sensible thing to do. Um, and this has no problems on Linux and no major problems, uh, there's details, but, uh, but on, on Windows. Basically everything is great. But on OS X, there is a problem because um, on OS X, the only thread you're allowed to talk to the um, window manager is the main thread, which is thread zero, the, the one, the, the thread that starts up when you start a program, that one that you're initially in, that's the main thread or the initial thread. And so that it gives us a problem because that means we can't use our REPL to ask, say, what's the size of the window? Because it'll crash because, and, and it'll crash with the error. You're only allowed to do this in the main thread, which sucks. And same goes for 
basically same goes for everything actually just polling events to make sure like to get input events we can't do if we're not on the main thread so um, what I'm experimenting with at the moment is there's a library called live support and this is used I use this all the time anyway because it's got a couple of helper macros um, if you're using uh, if you basically if you if you load Nineveh you're using live support already um, I will go into what it does is other stuff it does soon but the main thing you need to know about is live support now has a move REPL thread to initial thread function if you're on OSX and you want to use Keppel, or basically you're doing stuff with graphics, like, okay, I'll say right for now, just use it for Keppel. But um, if you're having problems with threads on OSX, load live support first, run this function, and it will move the REPL, it will kill the REPL thread, and it will move your REPL to the main thread. Then load Keppel, or load SDL2, or load whatever. And you're on the right thread, so if you touch anything related to Windows stuff from the REPL, you're not going to break stuff. That, and that's that's basically all I have to say. There's, like, this has been bothering me for a very long time. Um, there's uh, there's a couple of workarounds. You can start um, Swank, like the server side, in a single threaded mode. But that's a bit of a shame as well because these threads are useful. They're doing stuff. They're keeping your main thread free. So we really don't want to get rid of them if we don't have to. So moving the REPL to the, the main thread. This is experimental, but it's it's already helping me when I'm working on OSX. So I, it's the best hack that I've got for it so far. Um, the version of live support that has this function will... like will be basically it'll be in quick lisp next cycle um so that's good and that's that basically i've got a, i've got a ton of stuff landing in the next cycle basically okay that was the that was the end of my threads round if you came here for threads and slime that was it so stick around or go away i don't mind um yeah like um i've got a lot of stuff landing in the next month uh <laughs> just thought i should be out to go in um yes what was i saying oh boy you've distracted me there was it what was i saying i started saying something oh yeah this month we got tons of stuff landing this month is the first month Nineveh is shipping it's the first month a bunch of actually i suppose this counts as another announcement hello other people that may have just joined us if i've decided to link this part of the stream out as well um basically there's a lot of stuff landing this month a bunch of people have been trying to like, really hard to use Keppel, and I'm so sorry that it's been such a pain in the ass. And I'm really grateful that people are interested enough to try it out. Um, I have a lot of code moving around. Basically, master isn't where you want to be. If you want to clone all of the branches, like all of the projects in and around Keppel, you want to use the release quicklist branch. And that's the stuff that I have approved that is going to go in the next release. Um, don't use master because that will have things I've merged in that, again, I think are okay, but there's going to be bugs. Like the most tested stuff that is tested to all work together is on release quick list. The other issue is there are tons of repos now because I get lo like, well, I don't get, I don't personally get load of shit. There is a lot of shit flung around about Lisp programmers not sharing code not being able to collaborate. Everyone's got their own library for everything. And that's true to a degree because we come up with different ways of um, of doing things. Um, but I, I, what I've been trying to do is keep a lot of my libraries separate. So we have like the maths library is a thing on its own, RTG math. We have uh, Vario, the compiler, can be used without Keppel and all that stuff. There's Keppel on its own. There's Nineveh as a separate thing, so you don't have to pull in all that in case you, in, unless you need that. Live support, which allows you to, to keep the REPL running while you're in a main loop, like we're rendering now. Um, if we go back to... Ah. Come on, Chris, what, what screen am I on? Well, I got shit locked up for a second. Ooh. Something be odd in my Emacs land. Okay, that was confusing. Um, um, update. 
Where is it? Oh yeah, actually, when you're using the simple main loop, it's calling a function in here called, where is it? Um, update REPL link, here it is. And this is what, even though we're inside a main loop, which is technically blocking, this is what's keeping the REPL active. So yeah, all these kind of helpers don't need to be used with Keppel. They work with anything. Same with the image loading libraries, same with all the other stuff. So that is why there's such a massive amount number of libraries to pull down when you're trying to use Fraggle and then suddenly like, oh, I need 16 repos and this is really stupid. What I'd say is just wait a couple of weeks. This is all going to be in Quicklisp and then you can just do QL Quickload Keppel and get everything or QL Quickload Nineveh. Uh, this month, it basically, it's I, I'm going to blame you people tangentially because it's been really motivating doing these streams and it's guilted me into finishing a lot of, at least getting things into a more usable state um, so other people can use it. So all of those changes are coming very soon. Watch out for them. And uh, basically, yeah, just if, if you're really interested in using Keppel and you're having a hell of a time, wait two weeks. What's going on now? Um, other than my stomach grumbling in ways that may be on stream. Okay. That was the Ferris stuff. Yeah, it should be at, uh, Keppel uses 3.1. Yes, that's, um, that's my limit. I'm only dealing with modern OpenGL. Like, oh, new GL and old GL are, com I'm going to say they're completely different. They're different APIs, different ways of working. Then they're, they're just so incompatible. Don't try and mix them. And so Keppel just focuses on the stuff I can do. Um, Pomelo Pimps, you're telling us you will spam blog quicklisp again. Did it, was I, how was I spamming? Oh, oh yeah, okay, yeah, there was a lot of, there was a lot of stuff that month too. Yeah, basically we've got a, we've got more coming. It's been, it's been a good month. And on that subject actually, Skitter. Um, so input systems are a bit of a pain and I'm on the wrong computer. So this is my, um, another one of these, hey, here's another person making yet one more library does stuff that we're already uh, doing. Um, HBI, I'm not blaming you. It just annoys me that stupid graphics cards don't support that. I know, like, oh, don't worry. I, I'm not taking it personally. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, it's a pain in the ass when they don't support stuff like that. Um, you can try just saying like Kebel REPL and saying the version is three. It might actually give you a context, but stuff will break in ways that I will not support. Cool. Input systems. There's a few of them. Um, but this one is, I, I think it's a little bit different from the other Lispy ones. Mainly in the things it doesn't do. It's a really dirt simple system. Um, yeah, we've got enough time. We can do a little bit of this. Uh, yeah, oh, we'll do this. We'll do this. And uh, let me have a quick drink, actually, because it's nearly two hours. This is long. I thought this would be the quick stream. Right. I am going to load Skitter. Actually, I'm going to load Keppel Skitter. I'll get into that in a minute. Oh, I'm not going to load Keppel Skitter. Why is this? What does this mean? He is the Kwisatz Haderacht. Keppel does get her. Oh, of course, yeah. Okay. That's me being an idiot. I need to pick the right one. There we go. Okay, so... Um... Event systems. We have, at some point in your frame, you're going to go and you're going to call step host in Keppel and it's going to go and tell the window system or your host to go and pump all the events. So all the window events and stuff like this. And what happens then is um, Keppel files a callback. Um, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, if you register an event listener, um, it will call this function with every event, once for every single event. And then you can do stuff with it. And so this is where you hook up whichever event system that you're using. Um, and then it's a question of how you 
transmit these events through your program. Now, what like at the beginning, an area I was really interested in was kind of functionally reactive stuff or just kind of Rx or even just callbacks, just having registering listeners to different kinds of events and having them fire when those events went off. And I was really like, I really stoked about that. And I played with a lot of prototypes and a lot of things about it I didn't like. Um, the first one, well, the, the, the biggest hurdle I ran into um, was that it was actually when I was trying to build an entity component system. So I made a little entity component system. And in those, you're taking your game objects and you're kind of, your a game object is composed of a bunch of components. And then you can process those components in batches. And then you get these really nice kind of, maybe you've got um, contiguous memory and all this kind of stuff. You get nice um, kind of performance from those things and you get to reason about things in a nice way. Everything's very decoupled. But if you're iterating through those components, that is when you're going to do the actions for that particular component. It's when you're doing that update step. Now, it's no good if an event comes in earlier and then goes and wants to do things with your object right at the beginning of the frame because you're not ready to handle that yet. So what I wanted to do was take all the events and cache them in a way that made sense. So like when a position update for the mouse comes in, you cache that. And when you click something, it caches that the button's been pressed and the button been released, all that kind of stuff. But the problem with that then is when you query it, you've only got the most recent event, which is also a problem. So what I've been doing in Skidder is to, and I, it's not complete yet, but the basics are, is that it caches events in the first way and it lets you register your own events. And those are called immediately, say you have a double click event that listens to clicks. The double click will get called when a click comes in or, or a button gets released and it can only affect it. Basically, you're only meant to affect your own state. And that means that later in the frame, whatever code that's being updated can just go, hey, what's the state of double click? As if that's a button. So like like you have a, a key event for A, now you've got a key event for double click of A and all that kind of stuff. So that's what this system's for. It's incredibly simple. Let's if I just, if I just, so in, how do we do this? It's use package um, skidder. And then we can get the mouse and then we can get the um, mouse position and that's kind of where it all starts. And you can see that they have mouse buttons, um, which, so, how do we do this actually? Now I'm trying to remember. Basically, I, I, so I've been working on this and I've got the basics in. Um, and so you can, you can make event listeners and listen to them in a traditional way, but that's not how I'm meant to use this library. Um, you can get mice, you can get keyboard, um, you can get, well, it's, oh yeah, like, um, mouse down. That was it. That was the one I was looking for of, um, mouse zero. And then you can say, what is it? Um, ah, oh, it's, this is a problem. I've actually forgotten what the, uh. The thing is, ah, hold on a second. I've actually pulled in the, pulled in a bit of the wrong package block. Um, capital dot skidder. Now it's not left. Oops. Maybe not. Maybe I shouldn't be trying to demo something I've just made. So okay, that's going to say that the state of the left mouse button is nil. And so then, if I hold down the left mouse button inside here, and then somehow also hit return in the other window which is not going to work very well. No, nah, I'm not going to be able to do this, am I? Um, hmm. If I could do that, then I'll be able to show things. Oh, God's sake. I screwed up this one. Maybe I'll show Skidder another day. Right. Um, Hexadev, real dumb question. Is your face buffer an actual Emacs buffer that renders your webcam? And if not, Okay, right, no. Um, I needed a placeholder uh, down in the corner, down in here. Um, and so I just put another Emacs window down there. If I move, let, one second, let me, uh, let me move myself. That's what's behind me. It's just another Emacs window with a little face in it. 
The Emacs theme I'm using is Wheatgrass. It's one of the default ones that it ships with. Um, just looked at Intel's support page. It supposedly support up to version four. Like, okay, yeah. So it, Intel, they're getting, their GPUs are cool, man. Like they're, they're, they're getting there with that stuff, which is really nice. Um, GL versions, yeah, that's a pain in the butt. Like try querying for a newer version. It, it, it's a pain. Basically you have to, and I haven't done this yet just because it's very boring, but you should, what you're meant to do is make a context and then query the versions that are supported on that machine and then destroy that context and create the one and create a new one in with the version you want. And that's just blah. So I've been really lazy and not implemented that, but I should, and I will do that at some point. So um, yeah, try that out. See if, uh, see if that works for you. Okay, what was I going to rant about? Yeah, so I started going on about uh, Skidder, the event system, but I realized I'm actually a combination of a bit tired. And uh, also, I've only just finished making it, so I am not really in a position to demonstrate it very well yet. Basically, you can get... Um, whoops, if I'm on the right computer. Um, you can get keyboard and mouse by number. You'll be able to get game pads as well. It's really easy to define new input devices. If we go to keyboard, we can see that what we have is a bunch of controls, which are essentially types of input. So positions and relative is a position which will return to zero on the next frame. Um, sizes and wheels and buttons and things. And then a mouse has a position, a move, a wheel and a button. These are the kind of events that you can query for. Um, and then keyboard has N buttons and uh, there's a window manager that has a quitting state and then you can get the events from the window as well. And that's pretty much it. That's how you define input systems. So today when I was making, I wonder if I can even show it here. This is, this is something I want to get ready for the next stream. Oh, I can't connect here. That's a bummer. Um, I made a tablet app which has a load of buttons and sliders and it talks via TCP to your desktop so you can control all these things in Lisp from uh, from your tablet or phone. Um, and I was able to add um, an input device for the controls on the tablet really easily using this system. So maybe, maybe I'll do a, a dedicated video for just input type stuff. Maybe that's worth it. It's up to you guys basically. Or if I feel like I'll just do it anyway. So that's cool. Um, if I'm not doing Skidder, which is this event system, I think that's probably it from me. Like, we did some lighting. We rambled a lot about stuff. I think we covered a good bit of ground. You can tell me how that was. Um, and yeah, is there anything else you'd like to see before we head off? Um, and I want to actually switch while you're, while you're typing. I am going to switch the stream again in Play With Us. I want to look at those cubes. It just doesn't look as good. Makes sense. We really need to get some normal maps on here. We'll do that in another stream as well. Thanks, Pomdepin. Oh, Shimera posting. <laughs> oh, apparently the bot doesn't show up in the view count. Cool. Nice. Nearly through the comments. Oh, that link looks cool, Pump. That's, that's groovy. Huh. Let's check that out. Just before the stream, I found a um, an article on GPU-friendly binary searches. And I was just, oh, that's the most distracting thing. Uh, just before the stream, I'm like, oh, I just need to read this. Data structures and GPU is fun. Oh, 
Oh, cool. Nice. Elevator symbol. Is that the guy writing the book on the Wolvenstein engine? Pumped up him saying, yes. So that that is cool. Um, yeah, you're right. Must read. Dig into that. Okay, I think that's us. Thank you all so much for turning up. Lovely to see the new faces, and I hope I kept some of you. And uh, yeah, we'll be doing this next week. Yell, suggestions, questions, anything at me on Twitter or Twitch or wherever. Come on to the IRC in Lisp Games and uh, yell at us there. It's been, it's been a blast. Thank you so much, and I will see you next time. Ciao!